Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar this afternoon on unpacking the new VCE Psychology Study Design and Ideas for Assessment in 2023. My name is Kim Keane, and I'm the National Webinar Manager for Cambridge University Press. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, Cambridge University Press and Assessment acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Please know this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed by email to all those registered over the next few days. You'll also receive a link where you have the opportunity to give your feedback on your experience and of course, choose your free book for attending this evening. You can ask any questions in the Q&A box during the webinar. However, if you would prefer to wait until the end, you can ask any questions during the live Q&A session with our authors and Cambridge team members. It's important to note though that this evening's webinar has a large number of attendees and there will be limited time for our Q&A. So please feel comfortable to add any questions as they come to hand and we'll work to answer those prior to the Q&A session. Know that I will also be detailing uh, pricing and availability dates at the end of the webinar. So if your questions relate to that, please stay tuned for some brief slides following the Q&A session. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our authors who are speaking this evening. Uh, actually, let me start with our Victorian sales manager, Emma. If you might just pop your camera on briefly, Emma. Uh, Emma is the Victorian sales manager. Uh, she'll be actually in the background answering any questions that are related to pricing and availability in the chat box during the webinar. So please feel open to ask any of those uh, during the webinar. It's better to do it then than at the Q&A when we have a limited amount of time. So thanks, Emma. So I'll move on and introduce our authors now. Uh, Kate Gallagher, she is the lead author of the VCE Psychology team. She's taught VCE Psychology for many years across all three sectors in Victoria as well as A-level psycho psychology in England. Kate's also been involved in leading VCAA psychology as a previous study design review panellist, examination specification sample paper writer and examination assessor. Alicia, Alisa, sorry, Alicia Mueller has been a VCE psychology teacher for the last 12 years. She's been a VCAA assessor, a presenter for Carter Down Education Services and has written content for other educational publications. Without further ado, let's begin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy day at school to meet with us here uh, to talk through our brand new psychology textbook um, written for Cambridge Senior Science. My name's Kate Gallagher for those of you who don't know me, uh, and I'm the lead author on this exciting new resource. Um, I've presented at CDES, so you may well have seen my face uh, there for the last number of years. And I've also been teaching psych now for nearly 20 years. I sound really old when I say that, but um, yeah, so really excited to share um, our ideas that we've come up with with this new textbook. And next to me, I have my good friend, Alicia Muller. Hi guys. Um... You probably also see me at CEDARS. You may have seen me um, through some Adrolo publications. And I've been teaching for 12 years now. Yes. So let's go through the goals for today. Uh, when you signed up for this webinar, these were the things that we planned on talking through. And we still are planning on that. So we're going to talk through the changes to the study design. And we're actually going to do that in a fair bit of detail. We've got all of the doc points on the slides for you. We're going to talk about um, how, in particular, our textbook has approached uh, integrating key science skills across units one to four. And then also, lastly, we're going to look at SAC um, ideas and how those SACs should be implemented across units one to four. So what we're going to do now is run through the intentions for this resource. Now, we've designed this resource um, as a brand new resource for the study design. Everything is fresh. Everything is new. Um, and we recognise that not everybody has a big teaching team behind them. So this is designed for those who do have a big teaching team. This is also designed for students, for teachers who are new to the field, and also for teachers who maybe don't have a big um, staff behind them. So it's a one-stop shop, we hope, for everything that you could need to develop knowledge and skills for the new study to learn. 
So one of the things that we're really happy with and what we're really proud of is the fact that we have um, broken every study design dot point down into learning intentions. Now these break down those dot points, as I've said, into what the students need to know. Um, and they are at the start of every single chapter. Yep. And then we take those uh, same success criteria and they are referred to again at the end of the chapter. So um, as a teacher and also as a student, you've got that checklist um, as well as, of course, linked questions throughout the chapter. So it's like a reference point to go back and go, okay, have I answered all these questions? Um, can I, do I have the skills and the understanding of this dot point? And if I can answer those questions, yes, I do, basically. Um, nice, so the next thing, uh, so the next thing is we have um, on the left hand side, right at the top, you can see that we have a link. Um, so we know that the study design has quite a few crossover areas that can sometimes be quite hard to identify when you're in the midst of teaching. So hopefully this takes the hard work out for you and your students. And so every crossover area that we've thought of or been able to identify, we have included in the links um, in the textbook. The other thing that we're really proud of are our skills boxes. These occur in every section, so there is a fair few within every chapter. These include um, your dot points, so your just your key skill, um, sorry, your key areas, but as well as key science skills. And they are designed to help you and your students um, develop examinable skills. So reading questions appropriately, responding to questions appropriately, developing skills to help them study and revise for the exam. Now, including the boxes, you can also see there's an icon beside them and there are videos. So those videos kind of break down those skills boxes so your students can either read through the skills boxes themselves or they can watch the videos or you can show those videos if you need to or want to in class. And then lastly, we've got lots of great uh, practicals and also activities throughout the textbook, um, particularly to use for the increased hours that are included in the logbook um, and the, the hours of practicals that we need to be doing as psych teachers. So um, this is just a, a one example here of an activity in chapter 10. Um, those are, are staggered throughout the chapter um, or throughout the textbook textbook and um, as I said these are things that you can use for the logbook and in particular they can be downloaded as Word and in fact all of the resources um, can be downloaded as Word documents that are editable and could be made into a logbook for example that your students complete. And so there are lots more activities and I guess resources that we do when I show you but we'll do so as we move through um, the changes to the dot points. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of the changes to the overall study design. As you can see from the structure here, um, this is the current on the left and the 2023 on the right. The um, overarching questions for each of the units are exactly the same. And the emphasis, of course, on the biopsychosocial approach remains. So really not um, many changes besides some minor wording um, things here. And then on the next slide is just, um, we're going to go unit by unit. So this is unit one. And again, you can see here, anything highlighted, by the way, is, is, is some, like a thing that's been um, changed by VCAR uh, in comparison to the old study design. Um, so here, again, not really any changes except for a flip of area study one and two in unit one. So the order. Um, and then overall, I guess there's a little bit of a theme that you would have noticed whereby the dot points are actually a little bit less detailed than they have been in the past. So for example, they might not include um, specific or explicit statements of, of names of psychologists or names of theories. So it's left up to you as a teacher to kind of decide what am I going to teach if I want my students to have this understanding. Um, so we've made a conscious choice in our unit one, two textbook to kind of reflect that we want you as teachers to be empowered to make those choices about which of these topics you would actually like to teach or I guess which ones would perhaps build your students skills preparing them best for unit three and four so you can be a bit more strategic um, about those choices so in terms of unit one the first area of study is of course psychological development um, look it, this doesn't appear to have changed much but the theme I guess has changed quite dramatically in that we're focusing less on mental health and atypical development and looking more at, um, I guess, diversity within 
development and focusing specifically on like neurodevelopment and, and linking to that secondary um, development on the brain. So um, specifically, I guess those words, neurotypicality and neurodiversity, some of you might not be that familiar with those words. And, you know, um, given that we're a brand new textbook and these are brand new concepts, we've done a lot of research on that. So you can kind of um, rest in the knowledge that we've done the hard work for you. But um, very interesting topics. And neurodiversity, again, as a teacher, you can choose to, to pick and choose um, disorders, or I shouldn't say disorders because that's probably not um, socially acceptable. But, um, but certainly examples of neurodiversity might include things like autism and also um, ADHD are the two I think that I wrote about in that chapter. Uh, and then the last stop point, I guess, is looking at that holistic idea that we, when we look after someone that has one of these um, neurodiverse conditions, that um, it takes a whole team of people to actually help them. So, um, and in addition to that, culturally responsive practices. So um, that's specifically looking at Indigenous Australians as well and how we would cater to them. Just before you move on, Kate, I just want to point out that on your screens, um, you can see that there's a little icon there that shows you that there's a worksheet associated um, with that particular part of the content. Um, they scattered throughout the textbook. They will show you um, where the worksheets belong, particular content they're covering. And just a reminder that these are all um, very easily downloadable and editable. So you can make any changes that you require um, so to best suit your classes. And it's also showing us at the top there another one of those links we referred to earlier. And you can just see the nice visual nature of the textbook as well. Okay, um, I'm going to talk you through the rest of Unit Two. Sorry, Unit One as well. So this is the secondary study here about mental processes and behaviour, um, and how that's influenced by the brain in particular. And you're going to notice again here that the dot points, particularly in the first section of the study design, there, the role of the brain, um, is, is very vague. So it's saying that the students need to have an understanding of the different approaches over time um, of understanding the brain, and that could be anything and everything. So you could spend weeks looking at that or you could spend a lesson. So again, we've um, kind of included what we think as teachers would be the most interesting aspects of that dot point. Um, and then you can pick and choose with your students which ones you would like to cover. Same thing with the second dot point, roles of the, um, the, the hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain. Again, very vague. Which bits do I talk about? What examples do I do? Um, so again, we're going to, pro we've provided you with lots of options. Um, and then for brain plasticity and brain injury, uh, the theme is, remains the same, but we've just, or the, the study design, sorry, has included uh, a lot of different examples here that are more uh, contemporary. So ABI, which essentially is any injury to the brain, it's just the technical term for that. Um, and then also CTE as an example of, I suppose, chronic um, injury through things like concussion. And then um, other contemporary research, which I can't remember off the top of my head what they were that we've covered, but we've definitely done at least two or three examples mm -hmm. um, in the textbook at that it for sorry on that for mm -hmm. um, you and your students. Uh, and then lastly, area study three, which um, is of course the research task that hasn't really changed, just the question um, has changed here. So instead of saying that it's a student investigation, research investigation, um, the students have a question to answer, which is how does contemporary psychology conduct and validate psychological research? Um, and so really this is just a skills assessment. So hopefully by this point of the year, at the end of unit one, your students will have built um, all of the key science skills are uh, in this on this slide, which is stated in the study design. And the idea would be that they identify a question they're interested in and then research that. So almost like a lit review. Um, and then you, as the teacher, would be assessing them on the skills that are covered. Um, and just a little FYI as well, we will talk about this later, but with the key science skills, we have integrated those throughout the textbook. So um, one would hope by the time you get to the middle of the year, and if you've used the textbook well, then you would have built those skills so that the students are ready. Um, you don't have to feel like you've got to teach in the whole block either. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about Unit 2. Um, very similar structure to Unit 1 in so much as we've just had a flip um, of the order of area studies. And rather than, I suppose, practical investigation, we have a question that students need to inquire about and they need to answer. So in terms of um, area of study one, um, you will note in the previous slide that there has been a change um, to the title. So we have internal and external influences. Those internal influences refer to internal cognitive processes. Um, and so you'll see there's an addition of decision making and interpersonal interactions in that first dot point. We have, um, I suppose, a rejigging of the concept of cognitive dissonance. Rather than being attached to attitudes per se, this is more under um, the umbrella of how cognitive biases help us to um, reduce the feeling of dis dissonance. In terms of those cognitive processes, we're also looking at heuristics, which are, um, I suppose, shortcuts to help us make decisions based on little information. And then we have the tried and true prejudice and discrimination. Um, so a lot of that content will be quite familiar to you. However, however there are some changes um, with the integration of stigma, as well as some changes on ways to reduce prejudice and discrimination. In terms of factors that influence um, individual and group behaviour, um, we can see that first up point is very, very vague. Um, and rest assured, the textbook does include very explicit examples and ideas and concepts for you to be able to explore with your students. Um, we do have Zimbardo in there. We do have ideas of Zim, um, the individuation, group polarisation, etc. Um, but I do want to make a note to say that um, in this uh, I guess, dot, all these dot points here. Um, Milgram, Ash, Zimbardo aren't mentioned. However, you still could teach them should you wish. That second dot point is in conformity and obedience. And then in terms of media, we have specific, um, I suppose, concepts that we are looking at. So we're looking at things like social media news, um, uh, games under the battle or under the lens of social connections, how they change social comparison, addictive behaviour and information access. And lastly, we have a brand new dot point on independence and anti-conformity as I suppose a op opposing or contrasting principle um, to conformity. Nice. And in terms of the features here on the um, the right, just to point out a couple of things. So we do have a lot of visuals. You can see throughout the textbook where we're trying to condense information for the students. Um, in addition to that, you can see here another example of a video. I believe this is a concept video. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's where anything that's a little trickier or anything we think the students would benefit from an explanation in the video, we've included those and they will have a QR code that in the hard copy of the textbook, they can quickly, if they want to watch someone explain uh, that concept, it will come up on their phone, for example, for them mm -hmm. to use. So, uh, Erin study two, looking at uh, the person's perception of the world. Um, so, we can see the role of attention has been brought back into the study design um, from, I guess, this was a long time ago, um, from uh, Unit 3. Um, we also have um, top-down and bottom-up processing that's been brought up. That was in a very old study design. I think it was before my mm -hmm. time. So that's definitely, um, I guess, newer. We certainly haven't looked at that for a little while. Um, and that third dot point is really interesting in so much as we're looking at the influence of biological, psychological, and social factors on visual and gustatory perception, although there are no specific um, factors mentioned. Correct. So again, as Kate um, spoke about quite extensively, um, the textbook isn't vague. There are a ton of very explicit examples and demonstrations and activities you can use um, with your students, um, depending on their skills, depending on what their interests are, I suppose, to help them develop what they need to develop um, to experience success um, in the 3-4 exam or just in 1-2. Um, that 
second um, area of study is more about distortions of perception. So very similar um, to the current study design in so much as we're talking about the fallibility of visual perceptual system. We talk about visual illusions, but we also have included um, a new, not a new concept, but a new idea, which is agnosia. We also talk about the fallibility of gustatory perception. Um, more specifically, we're talking about super tasters and exposure to miraculin, miraculin sorry, or the miracle berry. Um, if you're looking on Amazon for that, that I suppose that as a demo and the judgment of flavors. Um, and lastly, in terms of distortions of perception of taste and vision in healthy individuals, which I think is slightly different to what we've studied this year in terms of the, the names of the dot points, um, we're looking at synesthesia as well as spatial neglect, and that has been brought back in from unit three in a previous study design. Nice. Um, and again, on the right here, just some visuals from the textbook. You can see we've got regular check-in questions. Mm -hmm. um, you've also got the activity there, lots of visuals um, to try and engage the students. And then um, this, sorry, the third area of study, um, again, lots of um, and more key science skills um, than I think we've looked at um, prior to this study design. But the way that we assess this um, is, is pretty much exactly the same. We're using, um, or we're looking at a, a practical investigation. Now, Vika does say that the way that students can present this is actually quite flexible. However, this might be a really good opportunity for them to create a poster um, in line with what is mandated at a 3-4 level. So let's get stuck into the nitty gritty of units three and four, which are obviously counting towards our students' uh, study score with an exam at the end of the year worth 50%. We still don't have um, an examiner's report as such. Hopefully that will be coming out, I would say, by the end, before the end of the year anyway, fingers crossed. Um, so we're going to talk through, um, besides the exam, the kind of skills, I guess, that we would expect the students to have um, for that exam we've seen over the past few years, um, that exam getting harder and those uh, higher order thinking skills that are being assessed. So we've got a real focus on that in our skills boxes, as you'll see. The overview of, this, um, of the actual units is, is very much the same. Um, all the areas of study remain the same. It's just that last area, again, um, with the poster having a question that students have to answer. Um, in terms of area study one, which is all about the nervous system and stress, uh, again, these overarching topics haven't changed. We have a chapter that covers nervous system functioning, and the biggest changes in this area you can see have been highlighted. Um, we've got the inclusion of neuromodulators, uh, which do affect the brain differently to neurotransmitters, and the students need to be able to compare um, the function of neuromodulators to um, neurotransmitters. We've got two neurotransmitters that they need to talk about, the same as before, glutamate and also GABA. Uh, with neuromodulators, they specifically need to know about dopamine and serotonin. However, um, VCAR didn't state specific behaviours that it has effects on. So, um, for example, I've included a few different ones in that chapter that you can discuss with your students that they may get asked about in the exam. For synaptic plasticity, this has moved from learning and memory um, to be, I suppose, in a more generalised context about how the brain functions and how we learn from experience, um, which can be linked to stress as well. And this forms a basis, I guess, of their understanding in learning and memory later down the track. Um, and then in terms of stress, this is a very similar component of this area of study. The addition, um, however, of the gut-brain axis brings in a bit more contemporary research where the students have to understand how stress affects our gut and how our gut is linked to our brain. Um, so it's looking at um, the link between neurotransmitters and, and, and specific bacteria in our gut, which is super interesting. And then um, we have our two models, which have previously been talked about, our psychological model and our biological model. It's just that the words explanatory power have been added at the start of those dot points, suggesting that the students really need to be able to kind of um, evaluate um, those two theories. Uh, and then, of course, we've got our strategies for coping with stress, which haven't changed. I think exercise has been removed, but otherwise that is basically the same. Go for it, Leash. I think this was yours, wasn't it? No, but I can talk about it. Um, so 
uh, Area 72, so we are looking at learning and memory. Um, so not much really has changed in terms of learning. Um, classical conditioning, opera conditioning is the same. We have taken out those processes associated with, um, I guess, those learning um, type oh, yeah, so like not yeah and stuff. Yep, yep all of that's been taken out and we can see that so dot point um is very much um referencing indigenous perspectives um that as well as the biopsychosocial framework is another i think overarching perspective that we're seeing a lot more of mm -hmm. in this study design um and it might be worth mentioning that you know this is this is a super important perspective um and we are we've luck we've been lucky enough to have experts who have reviewed um, and helped us research um, all of the I guess what we've what we've discussed yeah. within these textbooks so it is it is relevant um, and it has been assessed uh, or I guess checked over by um, Indigenous peoples. Yeah. Um, did you want to say something? Uh, I was just going to add that in Unit 1-2 we've mm -hmm. also included some of those perspectives that even mm -hmm. though they're not explicit in the dot points, mm -hmm. we've de definitely um, yes. run that theme through the textbook yes. so the students have those skills leading into yes. three four. Yeah, correct. Um, so in terms of um, memory, memory has changed pretty significantly. Um, we also we have the acquisition um, model. We've also with also the inclusion of the explanatory power, so suggesting some evaluation. Um, in terms of the brain, the brain areas involved in the implicit and explicit memories, we have an addition of the neocortex, which is effectively the same as the cerebral cortex. It's just the topper layer um, and the basal ganglia. In terms of episodic and somatic memories, that is more explicitly obviously talked about in this um, this um, study design, um, but more under the context of um, retrieving autobiographical memories. There's quite a bit of reconstruction within that concept um, and constructing um, imagined futures. We also have um, the inclusion of Alzheimer's. And whilst the information hasn't really changed, it's more under the, the lens of um, exploring the changes in, in those who have Alzheimer's um, through um, brain scans um, and autopsies looking at lesions, which is your neurofibrillary tangles, etc. And we have the inclusion of Afan I can never say this probably aphantasia um, as an example of a different kind of I guess memory experience. Um, the last dot point is a comparative dot point looking at written written and oral cultures and how they use mnemonics. Um, more explicitly for written cultures, we're looking at methods of loci, acrostics, acronyms, which you know we we definitely looked at before that has been previous study design. Um, but brand new is the use of um, oral people's oral cultures use of song lines um, and how they compared with the written cultures. Okay, so let's take a look now at Unit 4 and the first area of study is of course how does sleep affect mental processes and behaviour. So the focus here rather than on states of consciousness, which it previously has been, um, the focus is purely on sleep here. So looking at um, the ways that we measure sleep, uh, all of the physiological stuff, but also including things like sleep diaries and video monitoring, which we have done before. Uh, in addition though, which is good for us as teachers, we've got a really explicit dot point here is the second point where the suprachiasmatic nucleus and melatonin have both been explicitly referenced, which we would teach anyway. And you can see here on the right, like a really nice diagram that shows us from the textbook um, how that functions. So nice visuals for the students. And again, a video and a link and a what else is there? Another link. Oh, no, yeah, it's really hard for us to see. Yeah, it's actually on the screen. But um, we hope that you're seeing that um, in in the diagrams of the pages we're showing you. There's quite a lot that you can access. Um, uh, if you yeah, like I think a lot of the diagrams are provided in PowerPoint. Yes. So as a teacher, you can add them to your PowerPoints, yeah. um, as well as summaries and stuff that mm -hmm. we provide. So yeah, lots of teacher resources, um, which I'm sure will be marketed to you <laughs> after this presentation. 
Um, and so the second part of this area of study is, is I guess, an important um, part of it, which is for teenagers especially, learning the importance of sleep for their mental well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, and this first stop point is another example of how VCAR have taken feedback and added a little bit more explicitness to the dot point in relation to comparing sleep deprivation to BACs. So we've got ex- specific um, BACs, 0.05 and 0.10 that students have to be able to compare. Um, then in addition, also some delayed sleep, uh, sorry, some different conditions. So they've just got slightly different wording, um, delayed sleep phase syndrome and also a phase, uh, oh my God, I can't speak, advanced <laughs> sleep phase disorder. Luckily, we can shorthand those to ASPD and DSPS. Um, and then lastly, we've got our um, reference to Zeitgeibers or Geebers, not sure how to say those, um, but they are basically environmental stimuli that we can use to help us get like good sleep hygiene, essentially. Uh, and that is it for that area of study. Just like before you, if there's something that I think just, I want to make a point to say that last dot point is really important, um, I guess, as a crossover dot point for sleep and mental well-being. Mm-hmm which we will talk about now. Um, Just before I jump into the dot points, I just wanted to point out that obviously the image on your left you'll see is um, a concept map. Um, They, um, I guess, occur at the start of every chapter, the start of every chapter. Um, They are fully interactive on the digital website. Um, So if you click on one, it will take you to the specific section that you're looking at. But you can see here, here how everything kind of interacts um, so in terms of um, mental well-being, not too many changes. Um, look, realistically, in that first, I guess, sub, sub or that first dot point, um, is realistically more um, integrating um, Indigenous perspectives again. Um, so as you can see, that definitely is a recurring theme throughout 1, 2 and 3, 4. Um, in terms of um, applications um, of a biopsychosocial approach to phobia, um, not many changes, very small ones. They've taken out the role of the stress response in, as a causation factor and the role of exercise as an intervention. Um, and in terms of maintaining mental well-being, um, in that first stop point, they have included meditation. Um, and again, they're linking back um, to um, Indigenous perspectives yet again. So we can see quite a lot of Indigenous perspectives, um, I think more so in In 3, 4, yeah, yeah. than 1, 2, certainly. Although they're definitely mentioned. Um, And this last area of study, um, of course, is our key science skills. Um, And, you know, again, we could see that there is such a lot more than what we've seen previously but again um the way we assess this has not really changed i think really the biggest change that you'll find is the word count for the poster has decreased to 600 words from 1000 all right so we're up to the second last item on our agenda which is looking at how we integrate key science skills across units one to four and this is um a push from VCA uh, to get us as teachers um, to teach, yeah, essentially as we go, these skills and integrate them because we can see from the questions in the exam that they're not generally asked in isolation. Um, the key science skills are generally applied to co- uh, content or, or scenarios that um, relate to other areas of study. So it's important as teachers that we're getting our students to consistently do that throughout the year. And so we've made sure that um, as a writing team, we're actually addressing that in the textbook. Um, Just a quick little overview of what's changed. So the biggest things, there are a lot of changes, but um, the biggest ones will be things like the classic research designs are now called investigation designs. And we have an inclusion of things like controlled variables, um, qualitative analysis of data, new investigation methodologies, like I think modelling was one of those, um, ethical concepts as well as uh, guidelines and also cultures, cultural biases in research findings. So there's just overall more things to address. Um, in addition, we've got some things, thankfully, that have been removed, like um, minimising extraneous variables, convenient sampling and also match participants' designs. Um, In terms of um, how you might go about, I suppose, teaching 
while integrating these key science skills. Um, we've got lots of ideas of how you might go about doing that. And um, the textbook, I feel, makes it a lot easier for you to do that. Um, and the reason being we've, we've actually matched the, sorry, the, we've matched the key science skills to the actual study design so that as you go through chapter by chapter, those skills are being built. Um, as you go and you've got a teacher planner that's also accessible with the teacher textbook or the teacher resources um, and that provides ideas of how you might go about implementing those key science skills as you go but essentially you want to just be doing as many practicals as you can and we've made that easy for you by including those um, as well as uh, word documents as I said that you can download for every activity that we've included in the textbook um, and uh, what's the other thing that um, oh yeah don't forget that all of those additional terms that are referred to at the start of the study design are potentially accessible and we've included those so our um, key science skills uh, chapters have actually been divided we've got two of them and the reason being there's just a lot and so I guess it just directs those skills a little bit more and hones them in before we then build again in chapter two um, and uh, throughout the textbook we've got references back to those science um, skills so in our skills boxes you'll see little links back to the chapter one or chapter two depending on the skill that's being tested or built in that box um, on the right, these are just uh, ways that we've, yeah, uh, in, uh, what am I, what's my word? Integrated. Thank you. I was going to say included. Just FYI, we yeah. just record this very, very late, so we're both quite tired. So apologies <laughs> for all our, all our bumbling. I was just laughing. That was <laughs> fine. Um, so, yeah, so we're actually in, a, in our assessment, so like end of chapter questions, um, exams and, and those sorts of things, we've actually included the key science skills as well. And some of our SACs will also potentially include them also. Um, and don't forget, I've already mentioned this, but there are a lot of worksheets, practicals. Um, it's just giving you time to, to do the teaching and leave us to uh, making lots of resources for you. Uh, and just try to make it in, as engaging as possible. Um, which would be important. I think like, one thing I, I do want to maybe highlight is that we we don't have a, a specific finite workbook because we feel that, that we felt that they were just not very flexible so the purpose of being able to download and edit your own or the, the worksheets practice etc that we have for you is that you can make your own logbook you can make your own workbook whatever you, whatever you want but it's designed so you can cater it to, to your, your class students. and your and their skills so I'm going to really briefly talk about um, assessment. So I know that we've talked a lot about what we're offering, um, but you can see on the screen that we're offering quite a lot of formative and summative assessments. Um, and so I won't talk too much about that, only to say that they are there in the teacher suite, um, very easily editable for your own students, for your own um, purposes. We can move on to the next slide. Yeah. Um, in terms of assessment for units one, two, um, we can see here that we have, um, I think, more flexibility in terms of um, types of outcomes that you are able to do. Now, what the rules are surrounding this is that in every unit, you need to make sure that you have two different types of assessment. So, for example, for unit one, you can't do two literature reviews, as an example. Um, in terms of unit three for unit one, this is the research um, investigation um, that we talked about prior. Um, although, as we can see in that dot point, there are a range of ways that we can present that. For unit three in unit two, um, it is a practical investigation. Again, a range of ways we can present, but a great opportunity. Um, I suppose, to, to teach students how to present that poster that's mandated um, in Unit you know, 3 and 4, although you just you, you don't have to. There's flexibility there for you. Um, what we thought we would do is just show you that, um, I suppose, the range of SACs that we have um, prepared for you. So what we probably haven't mentioned is that in every um, area of study, we have um, produced two SACs. Uh, or outcomes that you can use. So for unit one, you can see the different types of um, outcomes that we've produced here. We've tried to pick, you know, um, newer ones or ones that were a bit unusual. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then for unit two, next slide, you can see 
um, how um, we kind of do the same. Um, so again, we try to do things that I think are maybe a little bit out of the ordinary in terms of types of sex. So you can see how there can be a variation of assessments um, for, for what we're looking at within Especially the study design. Especially if you get a bit bored like I do. I've been <laughs> for so many years. Yeah. So just to, just to um, jazz it off, I suppose. Um, you know, three and four, um, I suppose it's pertinent to mention that obviously there has been a shift um, in the weighting of the exam and coursework. So we have 50% worth of marks for the exam and 50% um, for our coursework. You can see in unit three that course the coursework is... Um, is more lightly weighted, I would suppose. That's probably a bad way of saying it. Um, but this contributes to 20% of the study score, whereas Unit 4 is 30% of the study, the study score. Um, I think the thing that's probably different for Unit 3 and 4 is that we can see that where there was more flexibility in 1-2, there's only four um, types of sacks you can produce. So you have to choose one and there could be no double up. So every single assessment that you do or every sack that you do from unit three to four has to be different from each other. There can be no double ups. Um, so in something like this, it's, it's quite important we feel and we felt as an author team that we're quite specific and we were quite thoughtful about what kinds of um, SAC type we're doing for each type of content. Mm -hmm. um, so if we move forward. Yeah, sorry, I just highlighted oh, sure. um, the command terms there. Yeah. Sorry, it's about higher order thinking, analysis, yeah. evaluation. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Kate's right, you know, we are definitely at a three, four level looking at certainly a lot higher order thinking skills. Um, um, and we're certainly seeing that in, in the exams and we'll continue to see it, I, I expect. Um, but here are some ideas for Unit 3. Um, and again, we produced two SACs um, for each area of study. Um, in terms of Unit 4, um, we can see that it's a, a slightly heavier weighting, so 30% of the study scores, uh, of the study score, I should say, and that's because we had outcome 1, 2, and 3. Now, again, remembering we can only do one of those um, SAC types across units three and four. Of course, outcome three is different because that is going to be um, the practical investigation, the poster. And lastly, you know, again, we have some examples that you can see. Um, so just, so again, two for each area of study. And then we just have some other examples. So you can kind of see what we've produced. Um, so this is a case study for learning and memory. And you can see here that we obviously have the, the, the SAC itself, but we have um, like the solutions for yeah. you. So is, there's, there's not much you really need to do. You can change this, of course, um, but this kind of means that you can grab it, you can go into class, you can assess your kids, you can give them a practice SAC, you can give them a real SAC. Um, and, you know, yeah, you kind of, there's a lot of questions there for you to use to assess your students. And the last one, and our last slide, um, is a um, is a data analysis. Um, so what they're doing is they're just analysing um, secondary data. This would be a really good one to include key science skills, um, should you wish. And I think it's something that probably Vika would encourage um, integrating those key science skills in their SACs, as well as in the content that you're teaching them. Nice. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for your time. I think we were oh, relatively good for timing. Um, we look forward to fielding your questions shortly. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Lovely. So welcome back, everyone. And thank you so much for that presentation. It was fantastic. So let's get started on our Q&A. And uh, welcoming back Kate and Alicia. I uh, will get started on some questions here. We've got one uh, that came in from Hannah Warner. I, I feel students are struggling with keeping to a thousand word limit. How are they meant to report any everything required in only 600 words? That I think that's, yeah, it's a really good question. Sorry, I just cut you off. That's right, do you want to go, Kate? You can answer. Yeah, look, I, I just think you'd have to be really clear with students and perhaps give them an exemplar of 
how you would go about cutting back the words and being really succinct. Um, I think you'd have to have a checklist for the students as well. Um, so I know uh, we will have written a, an example of a poster sack mm. and um, potentially a rubric for that as well, which might give a bit more guidance. Mm. Anything else to add to that, Leash? Um, no, I think you've got to look showing the students what a 600 words um, post looks like and saying, you know, you're sticking to this, you're not deviating, that's what you're doing. Um, and I think if you kind of just say this is what it is, this is what you need to do, I think, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll work towards that. I mean, I often as well, I'm a little bit sneaky, I kind of say to my students, you know, if it's too long, I'll just stop reading. I mean, I don't, but... You might, maybe yeah, you could say that to them. It could be part of the criteria as maybe. well. So if they've gone over that word count, yeah. you um, it, <laughs> then you, you're taking marks off. That's right. Um, but, look, examples I think are the key here. Yeah. Great. We've got another one from Nicola, Nicholas Temple. When you say that you have produced SACs for outcomes, are you meaning there are realised versions of SACs ready to be employed within the teacher resources? Yes. Yeah. So we might have we might have mentioned this in the video, but perhaps not as cl clearly as we'd hoped. But um, we're basically right. So it, for each area of study, and this is across units one through to four. So for every area of study, we're going to provide two sacks mm. with um, a marking guide. Right. So yes, there'll be realised sacks that you can literally yeah. pick up and use with your students if you wanted to. I, I might be. I might make a bit of a comment just about uh, one two outcomes as as different to three four sacks. Um, because the study design kind of the, the the intent is that you don't teach everything from an area of study. You pick and choose. Um, there probably will be questions in in some assessment that you you don't need to use. So I would be mindful of that um, when you're giving an assessment, I guess, to your students. And I think the other thing to maybe consider is that. The, the SACs that we write or the outcomes we write, they're two different styles. So um, as mandated by VCAR, mm. they they should be, you know, there there will be questions that you can kind of cherry pick from each um, to, I guess, even make your own assessment task. But effectively, yes, you know, you can you can run with them. Um, you can modify them as you want. They are fully adaptable. But, yes, we're hoping to make your job a little bit easier in the coming mm -hmm. year. Good job. Uh, I've got another one here. How are learning intentions or objectives used in the textbook? Yeah. Um, so they, so I suppose they, they, the learning intentions make up uh, the dot points. So the dot points are broken down into learning intentions and they are used, I'm going to say the word intentionally a lot, but they're used really intentionally through the um through the textbook in so much as they're broken down at the start of the textbook by the chapter starters so you can see what you need to know to experience success in the textbook as you read through they are also replicated at the end um, just prior to the chapter review so you know what questions um are, are revising or are testing that particular learning intention. Um, and we as authors have made sure that in all our revision materials, um, you know, the tests, um, outcomes, whatever, um, they do fulfil the well, in the textbook, certainly, the, all of the learning intentions. Um, and in, in the outcomes, you know, the majority of them, depending on, I guess, the style of the outcome. Um, Kate, anything you want to mention there? Yeah, so I mean, just to summarise what Leisha said there, yeah, so they're, they're stated at the start of each section of the chapter um, and they're also repeated again at the end with a checklist. So they're printable. Again, I think they're in a Word document. Um, and then secondly, I was just going to stress that, like, when we first started writing the textbook, way back when we got the final study design, that's actually how we started our writing. So we literally, we started with a list of what we thought were the really important aspects of each key knowledge dot point from the study design. And then we've actually written our materials to the learning intentions that we developed. So uh, I think, you know, compared to other textbooks, it's something I feel like we've done really well. It, um, we're kind of st stuck to well, what is it that the students actually need to know? What skills do they need yeah. um, to really help you as teachers if you're yeah. using the resource? 
Uh, Nicholas Temple has asked regarding online components, are you able to walk us through what Cambridge offer with VC Psych? From my understanding, there's an interactive version of the text worksheets and what else? Uh, there's a list. There's a really big list, Kate. Do you have the I've list? actually got the list in front of me. So you are going to get the following. So starting off with a curriculum grid and teaching programs. So literally, like, we'll be giving you ideas for how you would go about teaching um, the key knowledge and how long that would take you, and then li links within that to the textbook. So in terms of, you know, which um, section covers which dot point, um, mm -hmm. what activities relate to that dot point, and so on. So it's almost like a teaching plan that you can use yeah. for the basis of your teaching. Um, every chapter test that's provided in the normal textbook is then um, editable and printable from the online version. So you've got Word documents that, again, can be changed to suit your students with answers, of course. Then you've got checklists, as I mentioned earlier, all linked to the success criteria um, and with a list as well of all of the questions within each chapter that are linked to those um, key knowledge and also key skills. Then we've got, in addition, the list goes on, uh, question bank. So this is um, a means as a teacher to kind of create tests and those have all got um, answers as well. Then you've got practice exams, assessment tasks. So that is SACS essentially that we've been talking about, two per area of study with answers, as well as um, worksheets, which we mentioned before, um, that are Word documents that you can download and edit at your leisure. What was that? With answers. Yes, <laughs> have answers. with answers, correct. <laughs> um, then we've got also PowerPoint files uh, that include things like diagrams and flowcharts that you can use in your teaching um, to then edit and, and use again um, at your leisure. And then we've also got practical activities because we know, and I think that we mentioned this um, in our presentation, that the, the hours of the logbook and sort of the expectation from VCAR um, about practicals has increased. Um, so we're making that easier for you and that we've got all of the activities are downloadable in Word documents, again, that you can put into a logbook for your students, as well as practical, um, more, I suppose, like, what's the word, like formal um, pracs as well. And then uh, the list keeps going. We've got chapter summaries as well, which would be really helpful for your students to then compare if they've made their own summary to check they've got all the important information in that summary. Um, and then teacher notes as well. So any sort of little extra tidbits that we as teachers think, oh, this would be useful to chat about with your students or this is useful for you to have a bit of background understanding on. Those kind of um, come up throughout the text as you hover your mouse over over them with a capital T, I'm pretty sure, is how that comes up. And also, um, last but not least, we have like curated links to internet resources. So we're again, we've done all the hard work for you in that we've actually sourced what we think are really useful um, videos and like websites or a piece of research that might be useful for you as a teacher. I'll um, just jump in and say so. There's also videos as well. Um, that, yes. That <laughs> so as as you could hopefully see the list does go on um and the videos i would like to mention i guess there's two kinds of videos um and they are indicated by icons within the textbook both interactive and hard copy um so the videos the one sort of videos um are skills based so they're based on i guess um evolving student skill um in preparation for the vcar exam um and and they're things where you might want to do a question um with the students you could show them the video have them do the question then question sorry and then show them how to respond accordingly we also have content centered videos um that are i guess surrounding content areas that we felt might be a little bit more trickier um for students so there is quite a, a range of things for you amazing it's a huge amount of resources yeah it's taken us a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> we we've loved it it's been very exciting that's great. We've uh, we've probably only got time for one or two questions, but I can merge a couple here. Hannah Warner and both and Lana Salter as well have asked uh, or made a point that don't VCAR encourage us not to use pre-made sacks unless we alter them? Uh, I do. Look, that's correct. That's correct. Um, I would say, though, given it's part of the teacher resources, 
like ideally you'd want to be editing them. So I guess they're giving you mm. ideas, but they could certainly be used as pra- um, practice acts. Mm. Um, but yes, ideally you would be editing them um, purely for the fact that I suppose students could somehow get their little hands on um, yeah. anything that's downloadable. Yeah. Right. And I think, look, I mean, most most teachers will edit them because there will be um, questions that that you might want to change um, to help develop your your students' skill sets. Um, and there might want to be there might be opportunities to integrate key science skills that um, that you might want to include within the SAC. So yes, but I suppose the the intent and the point is that most of the work is there and so it is it is an ideas bank um and you you could certainly run with the majority of it and you may only change um i guess a few key things um mm-hmm. but the the questions are there the ideas are there the i guess the the stems are there in so much as like the case studies are there and things like that uh, let's make this the last one. Patrick O'Sullivan has said, thank you so much for this comprehensive resource. Are you aware of any PD programs for teachers that focus on building competencies for sharing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experiences? Any programs for students, incursions, excursions, or teacher education programs would be helpful? This yeah. is an area I want to get right into and have no idea how I will assess <laughs> That's a wonderful question. And I think it's a really interesting overarching area um, that we're all going to delve into. Um, what I can tell you is that I suppose when when we've uh, written our, our content areas for the textbook, we, we do have Indigenous experts who have checked over our work. Um, and the other thing that Cambridge is is also in the process of developing um, is, is, I guess, a studied guide for you and your students, I guess, outlining how you might go about um, studying and learning about this area of study. And that, from, from what I know about it, contains... Um, uh, lots of contemporary research, um, research that the, the uh, government, um, I guess, supports, gov um, information that is out there in the community um, that is all very that is already, I suppose, accepted. Um, mm-hmm. And so they're currently building that. Um, as to, I guess, PDs that are live, I don't, I don't, sorry, know too much about that. Um, but from from my research, there's there's quite a few um, really amazing websites um, that I've I've actually put I think in the curated um, resources. Um, and I'm so sorry, I I can only really speak to the work that that we've done on the textbook. So I don't know, um, Kate. Maybe maybe you have any ideas, but I don't know of any live PDs. I suppose. No, again, I'm not aware of any either. But you would think that maybe VCAR might organise something mm. like that, given they've implemented all of these changes yeah. that teachers are feeling very anxious about. Mm. It's definitely something that yeah. I'm hopeful that they're considering. Yeah, great. Well, let's wrap the Q and A um, part of the session up there. And if you, if we've missed any of the questions, we'll uh, try to get back to you uh, via email after the session, if there's anything important there. Otherwise you can reach out to any of the reps uh, and they will certainly respond to you as well. Uh, so thank you so much, Alicia and Kate. I'm just gonna jump to a, some of my slides at the end. There's just a, cu- a couple, there's uh, just to run over some pricing and availability for everyone, because I'm sure you're really interested in uh, when to expect these books and uh, price points. So here on the screen, print and digital 89.95, uh, digital only, sixty nine ninety five, and of course the teacher suite, which we heard all about uh, the resources that are compacted into there for one hundred ninety nine ninety five. Page proofs. This is what everyone wants to know. Uh, the units three and four are actually available now and late July, which uh, we're pretty much late July now, so expectation is pretty soon uh, for units one and two. And publishing dates are here too: uh, November for units one and two, and September for units three and four. And so I I always add this slide in so that you can get an idea of who you might need to contact if you're wanting to reach out to your rep. Uh, We've already met Emma Kapler, Carolyn, who looks after the north, uh, Kim looks after the east east and south east, and Marcus looks after the western regions. 
so I just also like to point out at the end or a little reminder that you'll be receiving an email uh, so that you can give your feedback and uh, also the opportunity for you to nominate the free textbook. Uh, you'll receive that within the next few days. But finally, please join me in thanking our authors for their contributions and our Cambridge team members and to all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Good evening to you all.